Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers take on various topics that tend to occur to them when they go off on this adventure of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, Jersey. I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience coach and an interactive designer storyteller of sorts. <laughs> Still, still workshopping the the, the the job description, huh? Always that title. <laughs> that title is like a mini mini story. I can tell. Um, yeah. I do a lot of things. Oh, I can't wait to talk about. Yeah, there's a um, yeah. One of the things I've been reading, watching, playing, and and uh, someone's bio. Uh, I felt the kinship when I saw their <laughs> bio. It's like, yeah, my bio is complicated too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> go bio. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, the last show of 2019, and we're only, what, three away from episode 300. It's hard to believe. It's really hard to believe. Um, yeah, it yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been, a, I know. I'm like, do I, do I play up the, yeah, it's been a long road. Surprised. Uh, <laughs> but here we yeah, are. Yeah, I see yeah. you showed up again. <laughs> here we go again. Uh, yeah. No, it's, this is... I love this. It's, it's, I love this project. So it's, it's been awesome doing this with you. And I, I um, hope we, um, you know, figure out something interestingly special and celebratory for episode 300. Well, we can always poll the, uh, the leaners about that, right? Like in the, in the leaners of art discord um, and on, you know, social media and in the comments for today's chat as we stream live on twitch.tv slash lean into art. But it being the final episode of the year. And we had just done an episode not too long ago about uh, journaling and reflection to plan for you know another another year, another project, um, just a few episodes ago. So, you know, ra rather than doing like a whole, like, what are we gonna do about 2020, you know? Um, you know, what, what, how, are we gonna, how are we thinking about our next year of projects and creativity? Uh, maybe because this is, we're also recording this like right after solstice, right after like, uh, you know, the Christmas holiday. Um, and a good number of people use this time as a period of like rest and refreshment. So maybe it's time to talk once again about what we're reading, watching and playing. And then we, we always break the show into two segments. Uh, the first half is usually what the thing looks like when we engage with the topic. So in this case, literally, what are we reading, watching, and playing? What, what are these things? In the second half, we usually get a little bit more thoughtful about it. It's like, well, why is this such an important topic to us? Um, what, how do we think about when we're in, the, the things we engage with when we engage with them? So did I, did I frame it up? Yeah, it's framed. I mean, we this is what we do, right? It's it's like there's the there's the reason we're here, but then we think about the the, the reason deeper. We 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 delve in and explore and question because we, I I mean, this is our practice. This is our um, you know, our gym. It's where we do some working out thoughtfully and mentally and all that, and that's what we encourage others to to join in with us. So it's really fun to get uh, folks commenting either live or or afterward and and whatnot and joining us in this kind of thing. Uh, even if it's like, oh, hey, we're going to like, how many podcasts are, are are there about like, hey, we watched the thing. What do you think? Or we play with, well, we've got our, our special approach to that is, is, uh, well, guess what? That's a place to begin exploring and inquisitive uh, investigation. <laughs> and that seems like a good time to introduce the musical interlude. Oh, I'm on a chair. It's different. Oh, <laughs> in front of the chair. I can wobble. It, it's like a pedestal. Oh, I'm on the same kind of deal. Uh, wow. it, it also we're streaming at our old time, 10 p.m. Eastern time, uh, instead of at noon Eastern time. So, it might be a little bit of a different energy too, because this is late at night for us. Um, but okay, <laughs> that's true. Read, reading, watching, playing. Uh, so what are we? We do this every couple months or so. We check in with this, like, uh, you know, what are the things we're engaging with for pleasure, inspiration, refreshment? Um, what do you want to start? You want to start with what you've been reading or watching or playing, Rob? Oh, you know, I, I teased it and I, I, I can jump right at it. And I'm not very far into this book, but I've been uh, reading Linda Berry's Making Comics. Mm. And I can't tell you how many times I've like, 
I'm an enthusiastic media consumer. I will, um, I, 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 make, I make noises and sound effects as I watch stuff. And I try not to do that like loud in a movie theater context, right? Where, where I'm like, oh gosh, oh, whoa, um, come on, come on, come on. And that kind of uh, eager, eager watcher and, you know, listener and reader. And I just can't tell you how many times I've proclaimed how awesome Linda Berry is. And I'm only like, what, 40, 50 pages in. Yeah, page 45. She's yeah. a powerhouse, amazing creative beacon of awesomeness and this is her tome of like how she teaches making comics yeah this is amazing and i i, I just the kind of it, it's it's in some way like in there's because of the planning and the goals and all that stuff right because where i'm i feel like such strong resonance it's one of those things where it's the level of hearing when i'm a teenager um Ingve Malmsteen play that song about his cat, right? Or, um, <laughs> you know, a good, let's see, an Iron Maiden tune like, um, you know, Can I Play With Madness or something where I'm just mm, wrapped mm. and feeling it on so many levels. Yeah. And it's, it's influential. This is what, this is, I, I, those kind of feelings are what I, I make building blocks out of that as far as like, this is where I want to go. Like, I don't, I, this is how I, plan what I do next sometimes, right? When I encounter this kind of thing, it's one of those things that informs what I do next. And, and what I've, what I'm taking from it is like this kind of her, uh, her teaching style. I want to work into more with, with, with like teaching UX and the, the, the workshops I work on for next year. So what is it, what is it specifically, if you could name like okay. one or two things that she does specifically right. that makes you feel like that? We got the feeling. We definitely no, got check the this out. Okay. Right. So, um, so part of how she, she takes the 10, everything are, there's so many great exercises and whatnot. She credits her sources that she gets them from. And there's other books. That's a good sign of a, of a neat book too, which this happened to me with, uh, uh, understanding comics with a, you know, a, a good, um, you know, good references and, and, and noting in a bi bibliography kind of thing, or even along the way, just footnotes kind of thing. And where it's like, Oh, this lesson was adapted from, uh, Ivan Bernetti. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of thing. I'm like, oh, I got to find out what Ivor Bernetti's written. And um, so here's an exercise called, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, four drawings in 12 minutes. Okay, there's another one I was conflating with, with how she takes attendance. Um, where, uh, let's see. So on an index card, like four by six, uh, you create essentially a, a very simplified kind of, not exactly the H-ball style, but it's not, not you know it's it's in the, mm -hmm. the same realm but I'm, I'm so i find myself like where did i get influenced to, you know to land on that and so you draw a picture of yourself full body and that's how you take attendance right and then in that and other exercises this is where she mentions something else that she does she likes to have her students hold up their drawings when they finish each one and say and she says hold them up so that the drawings can see each other <laughs> <laughs> that's a very Linda like Barry i'm like she, yeah. i mean things like that i'm like oh yep she's brilliant <laughs> yeah she is and she anyway. she last i knew she still had a tumblr blog called the nearsighted monkey where she would actually post little like assignments from her classrooms and they oh. were often like that kind of whimsical and playful but like with with a deep deep wisdom sort of uh woven in right it's it's like it's it, she's the cartooning equivalent of when luke skywalker first meets yoda and he's acting all crazy <laughs> you know he's, he's acting like a like, like a little yeah. weirdo but like there's like like there's like super wisdom going on behind that kind of thing like the yeah the, the wise fool kind of thing like there's something that feels like there's a little bit of that because i've seen her talk before like she actually came to ann arbor when i still lived there and did a talk at Whoa. the university and oh my gosh, if you can see her talk live, do it, do it, do it, do it. You will not be sorry. Um, it's just a marvelous way of making really abstract ideas very concrete in this very playful and super entertaining way. And the example I always think of, and I know I've mentioned it on the show before, is she told the story of like how she was trying to figure out how do I define what an image is? What's an image? And 
she tells the story of her grandmother or her mother who was, who was trying to you know, convince her to like, you know, not be, uh, um, you know, a, a naughty or, uh, irascible child. And she says, uh, you know, it, uh, in the afterlife, in heaven, God has a castle that he's built for you out of gold bricks. And every time you do that, and it points to the, acti- the thing that she just caught her doing, he takes a brick away. You know, like that's an image. It's it's a visualization of an abstract concept that communicates information, right? And it's like, yeah, that's just like catnip to guys like us. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I you, you can easily dismiss aspects of your creative voice that that don't inherently map to industriousness and problem solving and and working through a process to get something out the door to serve your audience and to get paid and all these kinds of things right where Mm -hmm. um that mechanism needs to exist alongside other other mechanisms that that where where um there's so much intentionality and creativeness and playfulness and uh from a uh a willingness to observe at the very base level, what's occurring and rediscover things that a lot of times we just gloss over. And there's like another piece of uh, wisdom is that, that um, it mentioned, it's mentioned in a couple of different ways, but that she's talking about how drawing or writing as far as like when we're really young, like being four year old, uh, there's um, drawing, like writing words and drawing aren't necessarily separate things, right? You're in, and we end up separating them. And so I don't know, I'm, I'm not really doing a great quote of it, but like that, that concept's in here in a variety of ways. And it's a reminder that there, I think there's, there's more to how we solve problems than necessarily what's prescribed and contextually commonly accepted for how we solve problems. And I, and she points, she has that uh, well represented in this book. Making Comics by Linda Berry. I put a link in the chat, and it will be linked in the show notes. Uh, awesome recommendation. All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, and her bio. We can come back to her bio later. Oh, no, no. Let's, let's yeah, please, close out with that, because you, you mentioned that as being like something where you felt like some kinship. Okay. Well, where was I reading? I think it's her bio on Amazon. So let's see. I did not pull up that link, but... Oh, uh, Linda Berry, I can uh, making comics, and then, of course, Amazon's got very good Google Foo, Google Google Energy, and whatnot. Um, but if you, all right, here uh, we go. Linda Berry has worked as a painter, cartoonist, writer, illustrator, play, playwright, <laughs> editor, commentator, and teacher, and found they are very much alike. <laughs> She is the yeah. in- inimitable creator behind the seminal comic strip that was syndicated across North America in alternate weeklies for two decades, Ernie Pook's Comic, featuring incomparable... Oh my gosh, this, this, this is a long bio. Uh, incomparable yeah, Merrill's and Freddie. it goes on to provide a lot of accomplishments. I, I, I mean, but, but that first the, sentence. the beginning, right? Try yes. to, you know, go ahead, try to pin down what she is, right? Good luck. Let's let's read that one more time. <laughs> Linda Berry has worked as a painter, cartoonist, writer, illustrator, playwright, editor, commentator, and teacher, and found they are very much alike. It's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. worth saying. Um, it's worth repeating for sure. So Linda Berry. Yeah. So it's not that simple bio of like that's a simple story, and you're a cog that fits exactly within this commonly described industry, you know, branded career pathed mechanism yes i have feelings mm. on this <laughs> uh well it makes it makes you wonder uh if cartoonists and teaching artists is cutting off any any uh potential limbs uh in and in, in the uh, interest of brevity i don't know once in a while there are amazingly beautiful powerful machines that get invented and your title is one <laughs> i just I cannot find the, I have not found the equivalent for, for me. <laughs> hmm. But well, so that, maybe, that... You're, maybe you're leaving something out. I'm not saying that either, but like, I, I don't like yours is like, so um, it has breadth and breadth, clarity and depth all at the same time. And I just, I just look at it and go, come on. You, you never watched the, the Lauren Faust, my little pony show. Did you? A little bit, yeah. There, there was these characters called the Cutie Mark Crusaders, and there was this lovely idea of like every pony has like uh, a cutie mark, this like this mm-hmm. thing, this symbol on their rump that defines like what their 
utility is in society. And, you know, and I've been doing this, this Transformers podcast with an old friend of mine, and I've been talking a lot about how um, on the Transformers file cards would say function. This is what their function is. Function warrior, function scientist, function medic. And, and like as a kid, I remember thinking like how marvelous that was that they know who they are and what they need to do, like what they're here to do, right? And as a kid, you're not formed yet. You don't know. And, and figuring that out, like even though I knew I wanted to make comics when I was 11, I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't know how you get there. And so it still felt very nebulous. And then even then, like, what kind of cartoonist am I going to be? Am I going to do action superhero comics? Am I going to do funny comics or comic strips? You know, what am I going to do? So in the new show, like, they show, like, all these characters with these cutie marks. So it's like, here's, you know, Pinkie Pie. She's the, the joyful partying one. Here's Rarity. She's, like, the, you know, uh, artful designer one. And then there's these younger ones who don't have their cutie marks yet. They have to discover what they are, you know? And they, they call themselves the cutie mark crusaders because they're on the crusade to find out who they are so they can get their cutie marks. And I feel like there's something analogous in your journey to find the the, the one-sentence <laughs> statement. And then, and then the symbol will appear on your hindquarters, and you'll know. I've got Thanks. cartoons to teach you. Honestly, ready. mine keeps falling off because I keep writing crap on sticky notes, and I'm like, "That's my cutie mark." Goes flies away eventually. Even the good sticky notes don't stick that long. Uh, now I'm thinking I'll get another tattoo. We <laughs> 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 uh, gotta find a symbol for teaching, not a graduation cap. Um, okay, so let's see. What am I reading? I well. I'm going to sound potentially highfalutin, but I enjoy this topic. Um, so, whoops, I switched to the wrong tab. Um, so my library, uh, the library here in Columbus, has um, those digital borrowing services like Overdrive and Hoopla. And uh, I've been listening to a lot of great courses uh, series on Hoopla. And man, I feel like this is like where we could get some sponsorship here <laughs> because I, I do consume a lot of great courses content like uh, David McCraney. Um, mm. But uh, the one I've been, I'm in the middle of right now is great minds of the Eastern intellectual tradition. And so it's this, it's this cursory survey of a variety of, um, you know, philosophy from, you know, East of what, you know, East of uh, Europe, so, you know, talking about giving like a broad overview of, of Taoism, Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Um, what am I in the middle? I just finished Confucianism and there's 36 chapters in the series. And it's it's just it's lectures and it's it's kind of heavy listening, but it's the kind of listening that I really enjoy doing when I'm inking. So if you're if you're doing an activity that doesn't require 100 percent of your brain, this is the kind of stuff that I like to have going on in the background. Um, it's uh and it's also, I mean, like, you know, I can listen to a lot of podcasts too, um, but there's something about disengaging from the wider discussion that's happening in the world right now on a variety of topics. You know, people are talking about the big feelings they're having about the latest Star Wars movie. They're having big feelings about what's happening in politics. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? What will make me feel refreshed and able to, like, engage with that again is if I disengage for a short amount of time. And that's when I turn to things like this. So, uh, and it's sort of... Um, I, this is stuff I've studied and read about for literally decades now, but it's nice to have what I like about this particular series of talks is it's giving sort of overviews encapsulating the big, uh, uh, what would you call it? The big talking points of each philosophical tradition, right? Like what's, you know, what's the big idea about Taoism? What's the big idea about Buddhism? What's the big idea about Jainism and so on? And then I'm even discovering a couple uh, philosophical traditions that I wasn't quite uh, familiar with, like um, the writings of Zhuangzi, the Taoist writer, who was like sort of a counterpoint to Lao Tzu. Um, so if you, if your public library has Hoopla or Overdrive or Libby, you can probably, but actually you can also find these at most libraries on CD. Uh, I know a lot of libraries have these series on CD as well. So the great courses, great minds of the Eastern intellectual tradition. That's pretty, that's interesting. I, I do, um, I enjoy the intellectual material during certain tasks, right? There's a, but it's, it's, it's like there, the more of my brain that's required to form words, the less I'm able to consume words, and especially that much uh, in-depth hold a lot of context to really f feel and, and uh, comprehend the point in a lecture, for instance. Absolutely. Um, 
what about um so is there um so is is it how, like how this one is presented really well and and is it the, the, sort of like paving over paving over gaps where it's like oh the log line of this particular philosophy yeah yeah, it, it, it goes it goes a little deep because each lecture is about a half hour long. So he's going to spend a half hour on Taoism and then maybe he'll do like another half hour on like uh, not Taoism itself, but a few of the key thinkers from Taoism. So you'll get like maybe an hour on each one. Um, and then he even comes back and like like builds off of like, OK, well, we talked about Hinduism and how it grew Buddhism, like Buddhism grew out of Hinduism, Hinduism and then Buddhism came back and then Hinduism kind of consumed Buddhism. Um so he's, he's also giving you like a little bit of like a, a timeline and in the talks he provides some historical context as to maybe, uh, conjecture, hypothesis, uh, and maybe even some um, uh, academic study on what would, what would the historical um, – uh, what would, would be the historic, historical events that may be informing this, right? Like, so certain intellectual traditions were formed during periods of great chaos before China was a unified country, when it was a bunch of little tiny countries that were all fighting about the warring states and whatever. Um, mm. So you, you're also getting a little bit of a history lesson too, but it's it's very, even though it's heavy listening, um, like I, the, the times I break this one out, because I've been going through it slowly, is when I'm on runs, when I can really attend to it and I, I want to get lost in something so that I can like <laughs> forget about the agony that my lungs are going through right now. It's like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Let me put my head someplace else. Um, or when I'm inking, like penciling, I think it just takes just enough mental energy of like I'm solving like, spatial and geometric problems when I'm penciling. Whereas when I'm inking, I'm really not doing as much intellectual work. Um, it doesn't feel like I am anyway. Um, I'm not tracing, but I'm, I'm just rendering a lot of pre-done work. The dialogue's already chosen, word bloom placement's already figured out. So now it's just a matter of like just rendering it into a crisper detail. So I can let more of my cycles go towards something like this. So I, I tried listening to it when I was on a road trip with Anne and she was like, this is, this is just distracting me how much it's asking of me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it kind of is. It's not <laughs> like relaxing road trip material. Uh -huh. um, okay. So. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a good one. We should totally look into sponsorship too. That's a pretty <laughs> awesome fit for us and our, probably our audience too, I imagine. And I've listened to a bunch of their stuff now and I can actually like do like an honest read on it. Like I could name like, like, four or five different ones that I've, I've listened to and say like, yeah, these yeah. are great for people who actually enjoy the stuff we talk about. To like do some nested Russian doll thing, but like I've, I have uh, multiple great courses that I've bought through audible, <clears throat> you mm. know? So like, whoop, whoop. <laughs> we could do a variety of kind of sponsorships. Um, <laughs> and Nate Marcel's in the chat saying, uh, they also have one called the, the creative thinkers toolkit checking hoopla. Now mm. I will, Creator thinkers, creative thinkers toolkit sounds like something I would probably enjoy as well. Um, that sounds really good. All right, next on your list, Rob. Well, I know we have one in common that I think yeah. it's worth just sort of running by it, pointing at it, maybe doing a pose and moving on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's the Mandalorian, right? I mean, that thing has caught a lot of people's attention, and I, it's 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 so funny how something like that can just capture uh, the the hearts and minds for a while. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's weird when like you, you, I feel oftentimes not a part of a hive mind, except for like this, like, like a little hive, maybe a tiny hive mind. Um, and, uh, but once in a while there's a big one and I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, usually this, Usually yeah. I'm really late to these games. Usually I'm like a year late and I see the memes all happening. I see all the art, all my artist friends drawing the characters from them. I'm like, I'll get to it soon. And then all of a sudden I look at my watch. I'm like, oh, has it been a year already? And then I find out, oh, they were right. But this is one where it's like, I started seeing the art coming through my feed. I'm like, well, I better check it out. And like they had the Black Friday sale where it was like five bucks a month if you signed up for a year. And I was like, all right, I can, I could justify that. Um, and yeah, um, I, I, we don't want to spoil anything. You know, like you said, nope. pose and then walk away. But uh, I'm in. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 wa I went, I signed, turned on the show like this because, like, I'm not a huge Boba Fett guy. As a matter of fact, like one of my critiques of like Star Wars fandom is that the whole like it's it's a Western and it's about like really like like a. a worn out world where like life and death are just like interchangeable and 
I come in going like, I'm here for the Ewoks, man. I'm here for the colorful uh, monsters and puppets. That's what I like best about it. Chewbacca is the best guy in the whole universe. Like, we should all be singing the praises of Chewbacca day in and day out. You know, so like, uh, show about a Boba Fett guy being tough and mean. Not interested, but like, it only took one episode. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose I have, um, I, I don't fall that, far from you on the Boba Fett spectrum. It's just the, yeah, where, where I, I, I thought, Oh, you know, that's, I enjoyed when I played with my star Wars figures, that character a lot. I mean, because it's a cool night looking character and he does look cool jet pack and stuff like that. So it's like, I aesthetically Boba Fett. Sure. Thumbs up. Yep. Totally. Totally. And it, Boba Fett as, as a character, as he was in Empire Strikes Back, awesome character right he shows up he's scary he's cool but then also like when Django Fett comes along it's like oh we're gonna really celebrate this 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 kind of character I'm like okay well I guess you know uh, more interested in that weird lizard thing that Obi-Wan Kenobi was riding around on before he fought uh, you know uh, General Grievous like that <laughs> like that's what I always show up ready like ready to celebrate you know um, am I gonna see a weird monster but anyway um, but yeah yeah it's it's so far, well, it's weird really monster great collaboration, right? So you got yeah. the, yeah, you get you get some kind of there's some kind of agreement sometimes between these different species, and they they can solve problems together, and that's 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 pretty neat. And yeah, I'm a huge Chewbacca fan as as well. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Mandalorian has has a feel that that's the feel is really fun, the plot's fun, the aesthetics fun. It's well it's well told story, and it's it's episodic uh, hooks that that are well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is. So it gets our both our thumbs up. And we've been talking about it in the Patreon only uh Lena Tart Discord. Well you guys have. I haven't chimed in yet, but yeah, I'm I'm also in. Oh uh, and Nate's chiming in. Uh oh, do we even want to read these on the show? Mm, <laughs> these are nope. it's hypotheses. <laughs> yep, that's great. That's awesome to hear that you have yeah. uh, uh, some some thoughts. It it invites that the the story leaves yeah. has blanks in it that invite your participation to to fill in. It is not telling you every single thing that you should think about it. Um, mm. And uh, you know, once in a while, maybe even countering something that you may assume, thinking like, "Oh, this this character could do something better." And I already thought they were awesome, but okay, they got stuff to learn. Anyway. Blanks, pointing at it, running. No spoilers. <laughs> All right, so is it my turn? Yeah. I'll do one more from me. Uh, what am I reading, watching, and or playing? Um, so watch, well, we're both watching Mandalorian, and I put what I was reading. Um, does does doing karaoke count as playing? Because I, I sure did that. It sure does. I did that I the other day for like the second time in my life. Um, really yeah yeah and um it was it was not unpleasant uh it was not something that i show up to do at events you know uh i I, my favorite thing to do at gatherings is to cheerfully discuss what makes people's uh minds light on fire you know like what what are you most excited about in the whole world let's talk about that um but I was at a holiday gathering and somebody said, it's time to bring out the karaoke machine. I was like, oh boy, here we go. Uh, I'll stand over here. And then they kind of did one of these and pushed me in the front. And they pushed Anne right next to me and we both did it together. And, uh, you know, you it was, what? yeah, we did. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was, um, you know, someone once explained it to me. I mean, I know I'm, I'm coming at this like super old, like, I'm, I'm not saying that my age is physically old. I'm coming at it with like the mindset of a super old person who's like, I don't know about this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> children singing and laughing together. No good can come of that, you know? Um, but I, I know that I'm coming into this late in the game with a little bit of like curmudgeonly old guy thing where, I, where it's just like, uh, somebody explained to me, he's like, well, no, it's not about singing. Well, it's about singing with all your heart, which you'd think that that would be enough to make me go like, oh, okay, okay, I get it, I get it, right? It's about showing up with chutzpah and with, with gumption and with like really just pouring your guts into it no matter how bad it is, uh, like living all the way through, right? Very attractive ideas to me. So yeah, we did it, and uh, I w- we were both surprised at what a good time we had doing it. So um, mm. who knows, Might we might do it again. Um, and there was something that was uh, really 
liberating about expressing myself in a creative way that I don't feel uh, any mastery at. Like, less than no mastery. <laughs> like, almost anti-mastery. <laughs> like, I'm going to wreck this song. I'm going to make this song worse, you know? Um, <laughs> That's beautiful. I, I, yeah, I'm, I, I love that. That that's, that's a fun kind of enthusiasm and uh, it's wonderful to hear that you're doing that. <laughs> um, I'm no karaoke pro, um, but I have uh, in the era of, of, of rock band, right. That's um, uh. yeah. I, I was uh, heavily invested in that game. Tons of songs, variety of genres. Um, I'd be, you know, uh, oftentimes singer, but I could play different instruments and, and whatnot as well too. And sometimes I dual wield, play some, uh, do like a, a, a song like Say It Isn't So uh, by Weezer and do the drums and the singing. Just Whoa. Because. Yeah. And now you're just showing off. No, I'm just showing off. I know. But it's, <laughs> it, it's like you just, so, so rock band has that aspect of uh, you save your friends, right? You're all trying to get through this together and, um it's neat where i think they introduced competitiveness and you, you try to not save your friends or whatever later on of course um <laughs> but um but it but the collaboration aspects of joy where it's like can we get through this song together and like mm -hmm. so let's not you know let's not skimp on it well like if we play it on too easy it's not going to be that fun so let's let's try to make it make it challenging anyway yeah good good stuff uh and i yeah i concur with that the whole like just doing your best or whatever you have if uh you know not that would objectively qualify as like oh yeah you know please you know go go on tour because because you're singing <laughs> it's still it's it's wonderful um <laughs> i wish that wasn't kind of a bubble in the video gaming market yeah, yeah. you know another aspect of of what we did that night too that I, I made a little mental note about that i thought was interesting was um we we've probably all had experiences where we've encountered a music snob, right? Where somebody's like, "Oh, you don't, you only like this period of the Beatles? Oh, you you know you like Leonard Skinner? Shame on you." Um, there's <laughs> Skinner. <Well, shame. laughs> but like we've we've all encountered that at some point or another. Um, oh sure. And and the thing that the about doing that that gathering, maybe it was the people there, but I also suspect that it had something to do with the fact that people are choosing songs that are right for them. Like I had, I had actually like a rubric in my head when they were like, okay, Jersey, you're doing this. I'm like, okay, it has to be a song where I don't have to do a lot of harmonizing and like, like uh, a lot of like, um, I don't even know the words for it, where, where you make your voice go up and down and up and down in, in like one syllable, you know, like, like the Aaron okay. Neville kind of a lot thing. Of, a lot of pitch changing, just sort of yeah. st stability. And then, it should you know. be something where we can almost just talk through it, you know, and it's like as long as we just keep the beat, Gosh, we'll I've be been okay. wanting to ask you what songs you picked, but so now the, you're like the, the first one was right up to it. Yeah, uh, REMs, it's the end of the world as we know it. Because it's like all we got to do <sighs> is just hit the, the timing, right? Just mm -hmm. keep up. There's not a whole lot of like, swinging pitches on that right um and and there's not a lot of like it's almost the song's almost shouting right so like like uh so I, i'm 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 going through this rubric in my head like okay it should be something that ann and i both know really well it should be something that where we don't have to do a lot of like m melody stuff and it should be something where it's like it's almost it's so rapid that all we have to do is just focus on just keeping up with the words kind of thing um and everybody had their own rubrics and so they were finding the songs that were right for them and so i got to listen and hear people's favorite music and them celebrating that favorite music in this really non-judgmental way where because you can't judge at least i didn't feel like it was appropriate or even it, it didn't occur to me to judge uh, a particular song when i'm watching somebody sort of hug it in this really clumsy and vulnerable way right um so yeah i, I think that that was a neat aspect to it that i wasn't prepared for um so anyway how awesome that's great oh, we'll have to look forward to getting together again i'm gonna do some karaoke <laughs> all right so um because yeah what a great thing to do with uh with a bunch of friends too so okay what um what do you think uh oh should i do it playing do it do it playing and then we'll do a break mm -hmm. oh, let's see Tough to say. So I've been playing, uh, I dabble a little bit, you know, here and there. 
been doing a lot of like sort of finishing up holiday gifts and stuff, right? But uh, squeezing in time, um, a game that is a great just chill out um, is Beat Saber, which I think I've mentioned before, right? I think I I have the YouTube video queued up from a previous episode. We're going to talk about it. Let me pull it up while you talk about it. Uh, it's the first time done? I've ever touched this game. Oh, let me turn the volume down on this one. Yeah, this super cool game. Well, we just um, watch it for just a second. Two developers, okay. two three developers yeah, worked on this. Two developers and uh, one oh. music composer. All the music in the game was actually developed. Just I don't know how well this is playing. Having a little difficulty over there, Justin. Had to duck under that thing. Yeah. Okay. So this is a VR game where you have lightsabers. Yeah, so you have um, so it's it's a rhythmic VR game with lightsabers. So you're chopping through these bricks that are coming at you. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of folks know what this is because you know, it's, I, I think it's slowly spreading. It's on a variety of VR platforms. Um, and Oculus is using this a lot to promote their products. I've seen a lot of commercials like spotlighting that game. Was it Oculus or am I thinking of a different VR? I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, anyone who's advertising VR, this is kind of the app that they want because people get it. Uh, people try it. I've, I've seen uh, kids and adults of all ages uh, this this game makes sense there's uh, because as you're listening to the music the blocks are positioned to be hit in rhythm with the music so it's it, it's you know the rhythms can be intricate but it's all within the music and so there's this reinforcing aspect to it as well and so you're just chopping stuff you're chopping stuff is there haptic feedback on the controllers when you're doing this oh yeah Oh, that's great. Oh, and the lightsabers, when you, when you, when you put the lightsabers together, they, they, they go, you know, and they spark and stuff. So, yeah, I do that <laughs> as often as I can. And, that's uh, great. Yeah, it's a joy. So, like, uh, you know, nice way to wind down. Um, because it also has, when you, you know, clicking up the difficulty levels, there's, a, there's more physicality to it, motion. Definitely don't be next to somebody or your pet. I sometimes have challenges with my cat who shows up on, at my feet and just is like, this is where I am. And it's like, Oh no, you know, uh, I've thankfully not fully tripped, but you know, that's, that's a puzzle. I don't know mm-hmm. exactly how to solve right now. Other than to try, I try to set up somewhere that's nicer than by my feet nearby. Anyway. So yeah, Beat Saber is uh, it, it's, it's got that physicality and music and um sort of getting lost in the rhythm and the motion and it's clever it's a very clever game it's it's got an elegance to it i think that the company was acquired too if i'm not Mm. mistaken and it makes sense you can make a game like that um that uh you know so i don't i don't know what's gonna happen next oh yeah but there was an update recently that that really um you know, within reason, when you feel comfortable with a certain level of challenge, it's, it's sort of, you know, as in, you know, a lot of games have, I mean, how do you make things more difficult? You can have more blocks. You can have um, blocks that have more uh, difficulty based on what they're next to. So you may have to, instead of if you have a red, red uh, saber in one hand and a blue saber in the other hand, the blues might be on the wrong side. And the reds may be mm. on the other side or they swap and there, there's maybe two coming at you at once. And, and so you're having to figure out these different things or you have like these, these alternating motions that happen and you, you just sort of have to buy into it. And there's a chain of 10 bricks and you're like up, down, up, down, down. You know, like based on how it starts, you just get a feel for it. And, and it's, um, it, it has a lot of clever ways to increase the difficulty. But recently they added blocks that don't come at you in one direct chain. They're coming at you from, um, like 45 degree angles and stuff. And so you're oh, having wow. to look down different tracks as, yeah. So um, clever change. And I, I th- very interesting. Um, How are your triceps added- feeling after doing a session with this? It's more cardio than weight, right? Well, sure. Um, but I just mean like the, the, the rep- repetitive movement of your arms. I imagine that they would do something for your, no? I'm sure, I'm swole, but... <laughs> No, I don't. I don't, well, I, I don't know. I have not found any effects as far as Beat Saber with uh, um, the okay, the the um, I guess the resistance aspect of it, or the repetitiveness is more about um, a, um, a cardio. I mean, I do. F- I can. I can make break a sweat playing Beat Saber. I think that's at least fifty percent the effort and fifty percent, you know, getting nervous. 
but okay. a good nervous. Beat Saber. Mm-hmm. Ready to take a break, and we'll talk a little bit about what some of the leaners have been consuming, uh, what they talked about in the Discord, and we'll talk a little bit about, like, you know, the philosophy behind revisiting sure. the philosophy behind reading, watching, playing episodes. Philosophy, logistics, leaners. Sounds great. Yeah. Philosophy, log- logistics, and leaners, all in the, the next half. We're going to th- come back and talk about that in about a minute and a half. First, we have to thank some people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be folks that support us on Patreon. Yes, Patreon music. Where are you? There you are. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in Rob and Jersey and what we do and you want to help make the show more sustainable, you can chime in for as little as a dollar a month. You can also you can do one time donation. Donate for one month. And then at the end of the month, after consuming all this cool behind the scenes content, you can cancel you know, at any time. But there are some people who have been contributing on a regular basis. I want to thank five of them right now. Jonathan Wordson, thank you, Jonathan, for believing in us and what we do. And Sophie Lawson, thank you, Sophie. You can find Sophie on Twitter at Sophie Lawson Art. Sophie's been doing this cool, like, daily art thing, like a, a, a piece of art a day, kind of like your unblocking project. So you can find find the, the entries at Sophie Lawson Art. Also, Tim F., thank you, Tim, for believing in us and helping to keep the show more sustainable. And Chris Watkins, thank you, Chris. It means a lot to us. And finally, our Patreon supporter with the neatest name, Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. Thank you, MWSP. It means a lot to us. And you can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about wherever you want, whatever you want with fellow leaners. And then also you get access to exclusive areas of the uh, Lean Into Art Discord. So patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. And second half, which means we another musical interlude. Go. You know, this is our last week of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Did I, did I, did we ever talk on Extra Lean about when I got to go to the, the parade in Neil Armstrong's hometown uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary? I can't remember if we talked about that on Extra Lean. That was a, that was a really neat experience. And if I haven't talked about it, we should on a future Extra Lean. Yeah. No, I, I don't recall that. I, that sounds like a pretty great topic. All right. So now we're in the second half. And I want to ask you about this whole idea of like, are you thinking, okay, so to be announced later, I've got some fairly substantial projects that I'm going to take on in 2020. And I know that in order to do this well, I'm going to have to be very attentive and careful about carving out time for rest and refreshment. Um, and so I'm actually going to like really look at a calendar and figure out how's, how's my schedule going to work? Like, what are my days going to look like? Um, and maybe we can dive into like whether or not, you know, like you think like you have to actually plan your reading, watching, playing time, but starting out in a bigger picture, I'm curious, has your thinking changed in any way for next year, how you're going to think about, you know, what you engage with for reading, watching, playing, how, when, or have you found a rhythm that works for you? I think I'm always looking to to adjust, and and part of it is the dynamic of well being uh, being in a couple, and having some par- portion of the media stuff be our common um, common activity, and I, I think that sort of uh, creates a, an interesting puzzle, hmm. and. And so I think I'm constantly thinking how could, um, like what kind of media makes sense this for, and in, in some inner time frame that, that has been planned. Uh, yeah, not every th- single thing and every minute of my day is, is planned, but they're fairly structured being a, um, you know, a husband and a dad and, and kids and the school schedule and all that stuff. So there's plenty of, of, um, structure due to you know life role things that mm-hmm. um that then i hang other other projects and whatnot off of because it, it affects those commitments affect my other availability for other commitments and i do consider um uh like health and fitness 
and the the relaxation and play all that as as important to have some kind of time set aside for even though if it's it's not exactly perfectly um like i may say i i'm going to try to do some kind of wind down thing every night some days it's a game some ga- day some days i it's a it's a show or just a couple of youtube videos or something that i've gathered and um it's that kind of intentionality that's uh, that I, that I do try to tune. So sometimes it's, it's pretty darn scheduled. Other times it's kind of these loose blocks and uh, that given day, I'll figure out how do I want to use that particular block? Oh, okay. Interesting. So like you'll, you'll have like sort of like, well, to quote, you know, Hugh Grant's character in about a boy, you've got like units of time that like can be, they're sort of up for negotiation as to how they get employed. Yeah. Um, and, it, they may be um, earmarked in a themed way where I want to, I want to watch something and maybe I, I know, well, there's, there's a few different options and I'll tell you a lot of media, it can fall into a, um, a type of tone or mood that nourishes me in some ways, but also stresses me out <laughs> looking at you game of Thrones and stuff like that. Um, where I, it's, there's just so many friends and I, and one that, that, where it's this big cultural touch point. And, and, uh, and I finally found, you know, you know, that you have you ever been in that situation where you don't really, and I don't, don't just mean this in a friendly way to say, I don't like it, but to, where you're in a situation where you don't know how to like it. Mm. Can you elaborate? So, okay. Um, Sometimes, so, so I started watching, I tried watching Game of Thrones way back. Um, I think when you could um, get DVDs in the mail from Netflix, I don't know if that's Oh, the wow. Thing. I didn't realize it was that old. Okay. Um, and I, I thought, okay, there's fantasy. You got some sword fighting. You got some, some people to root for and solving problems in this big epic world. Epic sounds good. I like a Lord of the Rings or what. It's okay, great. And it's not that. And um, plenty of fantasy, plenty of other things and trappings and themes and whatnot. But like there's a um, looking at it for the hero's journey. It's not your, um, it's, it's not your, you know, former generation's hero's journey type of thing. And mm-hmm. I can't tell you how it ends or whatever. I wouldn't if I knew. Um, but, uh, but it's not that typical flow. And, and, and because, that, because of that, I was not interested for a long time. But then I got enough context where I started to learn how I might be able to like it. And mm-hmm. so I've been testing that. But not okay. every night am I ready for entertainment as a test of something that's part learning and whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, where it's yeah, like, I yeah. don't want to study tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I ran into a similar thing with the CW superhero TV series, like The Flash, Supergirl, oh, yeah. Arrow, and Legends of Tomorrow, which every year they've been doing this like mid-year crossover event where uh, they all the shows, like they were four-part series or whatever, where like each week one of those series would play the next part of that crossover, mirroring what comic books did when we were kids, right? Uh, I think that they still do that now. And it is, but it more and more it started demanding, or rather demanding, it explicitly asks you to catch up on all four series in order to be able to fully enjoy the crossover event, right? Because now when Supergirl shows up, if you haven't been following along, there's these three new characters and like, oh my gosh, they introduced that character? They introduced Brainiac 5? I had no idea. Now I gotta go back and find out how Brainiac 5 got involved in the show because I, I punched out, you know, way after mon was introduced. Um, so it turned into this thing where it felt like, oh God, I got to watch Legends of Tomorrow today in order to find out, like, you know, keep up with this thing so that when the crossover happens, I can fully be present for it. And finally, it started to feel like it felt like homework. It, it literally felt like homework. It felt like this this task that I had to find time for in my day, and there was no excitement for it. It was it was almost drudgery. And so... I'm sorry for you to be laughing at that. It just, what a funny, but I totally get it. And and yeah. it, they, they succeeded in, I mean, you know, like some... As a business model, I wonder if it was necessary for them to do that. 
Um, or if well, it's in the air because of all the Marvel crossovers and then the history of comics and the crossovers. and Probably partially that, but also I think my, my suspicion is, and I don't have any marketing data to back this up, but my it feels like the shows are marketed towards young people, teenagers, right? And who has time? Teenagers have time. They can keep up with all this stuff uh, in order to be able to, you know, you know, so like if you, it doesn't feel like it's a big ask for somebody who has that extra space. Like when, you know, the, the Marvel and DC crosses, crossovers were happening when I was a kid, it was trivial for me to quickly catch up on all of the stuff because outside of school and a little bit of homework, what was I doing? You know, um, and I had a social life, too, but you still have extra time when you're a kid. Um, so I feel like that might be part of their math as they're figuring out, because like all the product uh, advertisements are like for skin cream, uh, you know, hair care, uh, beauty products and things like that. I'm like, OK, this seems like this is all aimed at, you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, also, you know, not to get too, you know, priggish about <laughs> uh, the, the, the storytelling of the shows, but like there's a lot of scenes where it's like, OK, let's take two characters and put them in a room and have them talk about their feelings for 10 minutes, you know, which me is like the, the, the guy who's like well past it is like, OK, yeah, this is the part where you tell your best friend how anxious you are about not about the adventure that you're having where the entire universe might implode, but whether or not the boy in the other room likes you, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Which is fine if you're into it. And I think this is a whole separate thing. I wonder if um, there's sort of, um, if this is part the art, part the business or what, but it's sort of um, like I shy away from games that have that kind of demand as well too, where there's sort of a, this entity, this entertainment property can be um, your part-time job. And a lot of people yeah. want to hire something for that job. Mm -hmm. And I don't. Yeah, you know, I've I've got plenty of other things, and and it's fine. I know a lot of people, you know, whether you do or don't, it it's that that sort of demand. Um, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I shy away from that. Yeah, totally. Same same here. And I think that's just it's a situation where I look at it and go, well, that's just not for me. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, I'm I, I can see who it's for, and I'm happy that they have it because actually, I will say this a hundred times: the Supergirl show is incredible, and the character is incredible, and it was so refreshing to watch a show where I really wanted to be more like the hero of that show. I was like, oh, she's so good. If only I could be that good. Um, so, yeah. Um, but it's just, I, I don't have the bandwidth to attend to it in the way that it's designed to be attended to. So, yes, that that's something where it's like, it. It, yep. yeah, it, it, it's, um, I have difficulty enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> and as no, it's, it's, a, it's a clash of your context versus the design in, in that yeah. it was, it was, it's target, it's, it's targeting a different sort of um, profile as far as your, your availability and whatnot. And that, and how awesome that that exists, right. Mm -hmm. That um, there isn't, and it's, it's, it, what is it, what a great situation to be in, but then it, sure. you know, creates a, well, I guess not all these things are, they're, yeah, they yeah they fit different profiles, so yeah. So what do you think as far as um, let's see? So the the let's see the how are how are you fitting the time in the logistics? I don't know if if uh, just to to wrap that one up, it's mm -hmm. are are you in the same situation where it's sort of like well I've got a a chunk of time that's on regularly recurring. Um, and the, t today is going to be more casual. Maybe tomorrow is more going to be more intense. Or mm -hmm. do you tune it like that? Or just sort of, you've got a, a list of things and you're just rolling through it. Uh, I've been mostly playing it by year. And I've been really like being whatever the day needs me to be. But I have been toying with the idea of, I wonder if I should start scheduling some certain things. Like, what if Tuesday night... Like I'd have a specific, like, cause I, you remember I used to have a bowling night, like Monday nights were the nights that I went bowling with my bowling team. I thought, well, you know, there were times where that felt like it was an intrusion on my life, but then there was also a sense of, to quote Kate Shields Stenzinger, your partner, um, a purposeful pause, right? Yep. I've got a lot of anxiety and I got a lot of, um, a lot of different commitments to attend to, but this is me creating a boundary saying, but you can't touch this. Uh, sorry this this <laughs> you, you and this, that karaoke again <laughs> what i meant to say was hammer don't hurt it this is this is this is out of bounds like you can't like uh, 
this is a place for me to have a, a pause to joyfully, you know, be my true self in, you know, um, and not have to be what the moment needs me to be. Um, I'm thinking about that. I, I haven't like worked out like the math on how that would work out with my schedule. And I, I'm kind of nervous about the idea of scheduling my life out to that, like in that kind of a martial way. Um, because I, I, I don't want, I don't want these things that I'm really going to enjoy doing to ever feel like a grind, even though they will feel like a grind. That's just inevitable. It's going to do that at different points, but I don't want to create a structure of engagement that will increase the odds of me feeling like this is a grind. Right. Um, but isn't, so is the, is the potential for the grind, a, a is that a greater risk if it's more of a, a, a solo endeavor versus a social one? Because is that what, is that the difference what you're describing? That, um, you know, having a commitment for a team that's recurring, um, that feels disruptive at times. And I, I can identify with that. It's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's been a long time for me, but like having a, a recurring, um, I used to do a monthly uh, video gaming party and that was, oh, you know, a, a wonderful thing, but then, you know, I had to have a certain aspect of disruption to it, but it was in the end, like this, this pretty great, you know, release trade off connection with lots of folks and all that. Mm. Um, and that, I, that I miss from time to time, similarly, or like a, like a role-playing group. Mm-hmm where you're trading off working through stories together and stuff. Yeah. But you're not making the thing. You're just playing. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah that's a good question that, that I will, that I will add that to my matrix of thinking about this because this, this like blocking out time, I haven't decided whether or not that's going to be purely a social time or if that's going to be a me getting away from everybody going dark and just focusing on personal work, right? Am I going to hold myself up in the library for two hours a week and just work on, you know, this particular comics project that I need to make sure that I protect that time, you know, or like one of my future workshops that I want to do, or, you know, some of my other teaching materials that I want to develop. Um, can I like create some protected areas or should I create this the space for purely just, it's just me and buddies with beer and, you know, um, bowling or, you know, doing art drops. Um, so don't know. It's yeah, that's, that's a, that's an interesting puzzle. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. and then like how regular to make that, right? Because there's mm -hmm. always meetups. That's, that's an interesting possibility in that that could be monthly or is it, is it better if it's weekly or like all mm -hmm. that? All, yeah. A lot of things to tune and explore there. Um, hmm. Well, I'll get back to you on what I, what I, I mean, I got to have this figured out by like the second week of January. So, cause like I start, I start some projects, uh, like by the third week of January, I'll be full steam ahead on some things and I got to have my schedule figured out by then. So, um, and I think there's another need for this kind of thing too, where we're having the sort of the, the biggish chunk of time, but then there's the little ones too, the, the little playful, um, putter interlude putts around what have you things where um where i've been not on a hyper reg regimented thing it's one of those let's see um friend of the show uh, oh gosh uh participant in um the uh, uh our creative challenge art sound off oh tip of my tongue where he mentioned that we we talked about this uh, uh last show i'm what a oh, fantastic leonard, leonard angelo Leonard Angelo. Yeah. I mean, where he mentioned how, well, you know, those guys aren't so into rules, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, constantly, uh, building a, building a structure through which to solve problems and stuff. Uh, it, I don't know, there, there's rules, but, and so I've been trying to, um, I, I can't describe it at, with like, oh yeah, every day at 11 o'clock, there's this activity, but it's sort of when I complete a task, I try to step away from my desk because I notice that there's a kind of dip in energy if I'm not interrupting myself and doing some kind of random thing, making marks on a page, be you know, whatever, um, some kind of playful, creative thing. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's doing a quick, like if I can find a quick electronic repair thing, I'm, I'm dabbling with that too, but mm. um, to just sort of switch it up and then come back with a fresh, um, fresh eyes, fresh, fresh,
fresh mind as, as best I can. Mm-hmm. And, you know, go for another, you know, gauntlet of production time. <laughs> Which, it, you know, not to... Uh, color that with a dark cloud because like that is the that's the kind of work that you can get lost in and that's the kind of work where you really feel like you're uh letting your mastery do the work for you right and like when you're feeling like you're not really like the dancer becoming the dance and all that kind of thing right it's like that's that's the really fun work for me um you know i got to i got to draw for like three hours today and it was it was magical after not drawing for a couple days you know because of the holidays and everything Mm -hmm. um and it, it it was like you know it it was it was um not it was not drawings of things where I get to really show off my skill. It was like journeyman panels where it's like okay, these panels have to happen in order for this sequence to make sense. So it wasn't like really flashy stuff, but like it it was the act. Like it was once I was engaged in the act, I was like, yes, that's why I do this thing. Oh yeah, I remember now. You know. Anyway, it's beautiful. Yeah, and in that kind of work has i think a a certain um a certain pull to it that can uh that can end up grinding you down a bit mm. i mean you're yeah. you you know being so pulled in being so uh engrossed in and uh willing to channel so much energy it's i mean you miss out on on things like we it's you, you know ergonomic needs um just are you sure you're really as good at that task on like, you know, hour two and a half where, you know, a little, a little break would have um, like, what, what's the harm benefit trade off, right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you're, or like, or like coding and being interrupted can be really destructive. But then if you are always operating in a way where you can never be able to take a break, is that the best way to solve that problem? (laughs) You know, that kind of thing. And and I think there's there, there's ways to adopt and adapt um, some method of of taking breaks, and I think you can use those breaks for a bunch of different you know needs and whatnot. And one of those can be playing. So Nate Marcel's in the chat and saying uh, having a game group is so good for me. Otherwise, I'm not around adults of my own age in social situations. Uh, also, it seriously feeds my imagination. I look forward to the next episode of our collective story. It's almost like a writer's room feeling when it's really good. So yeah, there's there's a couple things nested in what he's talking about in there that I think is important too, is that, um, I mean, it sounds so obvious. I, I really, I want to talk about this in a way that is not silly and surface level, but you know, I joke all the time about how like, oh, do you like being alone? Do you like sitting at a desk for eight hours at a go? Well, comics is the job for you. Um, and, and, and as a result, it attracts, I mean, like one of the stereotypes is it attracts a lot of introverted people and that's true for the most part, but I, I have met plenty of outgoing people, uh, in comics, but that aside, it, it, it does ask a lot of you coding asks a lot of you of sitting in one place and doing one activity in a very focused way for a long time. And you have kids. I am confident that, well, I've seen it firsthand. You have a marvelous relationship with your kids and you could tell that the, it's a two-way street. You guys nourish each other, support each other, and delight each other in ways that are just profound beyond expression. However, it's a different kind of experience than hanging out with a bunch of adults your age, right? And sharing experiences, sharing, um, you know, well, in the case of what Nate's talking about, mutual collaborative play, um, or just, you know, singing It's the End of the World as We Know It as, as loud and as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's a kind of yeah, a, a communal validation and an energy that I mean, you you take that with you. Just you you take it with you. Like whatever you're reading, watching, playing, experiencing, ends up in that mix of whatever you're doing to um you know put into put into your art, the 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 soup of stuff. Um, the, the, you know, the, the feelings and the relationship and the ideas and the assumptions and the broken assumptions and whatever happens, like, like you, like you described, there's a certain delightful chaos of being, uh, putting yourself at a new, in a, a new kind of risk in a social situation like karaoke or something. Right. And mm-hmm. that feeling can become so many things. It can become lines on a page. It can become, um, dialogue or a new character or 
who knows? Mm-hmm. Well, and, and it connects connecting with that beginner's mind thing, which we were talking about recently, right? This this idea of doing something you only get to do something for the first time once, and so like when you're doing it, like let's let's participate in a way where we're drinking in this experience of being clumsy and awkward and knocking over the the pile of cans at the end of the end cap in the grocery store, you know? Um, Yeah. So um, do you want to close? uh, Well, how about, I feel like we're approaching final thought time, but I want to um, also read some of the um, reading, watching, playing submitted by the leaners in the Mm -hmm. lean and tart discord. So how about, um, we do we do one more break and then we come back with some final reading, watching, playing from the leaners in the Lean Heart Discord. What do you th- what do you say? Perfect for final thought. I love it. Okay, cool. All right. Well, in about a minute and a half to two minutes, we'll come back and do that. But first we have to thank some other people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be the folks. Well, it's us. We make this show possible <laughs> by doing it. And we make other things that inform what we bring to this show and the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is a podcast that I create uh, called four million years later. It's on its third episode now. Let's see. Well, yep. Four million years later, episode three, more than meets the eye. Part three, the, the, the pitch for this one is super simple. Everybody. It is two old friends who grew up in the eighties, loving the generation one transformers cartoon series have spent literally the last quarter century talking on the phone once a week about this television series and we finally decided to record some of those conversations and every week we watch an episode of the transformers in order and then we get together and discuss what happened in the episode and reflect on uh the artfulness the inartfulness the 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 more commerce driven ideas and the the clumsy things that happen when you make a show uh, with this many people involved and how it offers opportunities for conjecture and wondering and imagination and how uh, a show that is uh, largely designed to sell toys in in a in a superstore uh, how that can actually sometimes be quite artful and sometimes be incredibly crass um celebrating this this marvelously silly imaginative tv show from our childhoods called the transformers generation one um so we just finished the first mini series episode one two and three of more than meets the, meets the eye next week we start with episode four which is the se- it's the beginning of season one proper um so you can subscribe to it at four million years later.com you can listen to it on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, overcast etc etc um yeah what it's, a cool it's project a, like <laughs> Yeah, no, what's funny is, is I was thinking that I joked about that kind of thing in the beginning of the show (laughs) and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's awesome to like, you think about how many years of experience that, that you two have together, like a lot of companies who are, who are starting, they would, they would claim like, um, you know, like 80 years experience because you add your experience together or whatever, right? I mean, they, they would claim like some huge number, especially when you're, that's a good idea when you're a startup and you, you have like a younger crew and you just kind of add up everyone's years. Um, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> collectively, We've got 50, we have. Collectively, yeah. we have 50 years experience talking about a show that's only 35, 36 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and it's true. Anyway, that's uh, like what a, the, I think that that has that's inherently of a different nature, and the kind of perspective that you can bring to that is that's that's beyond like a, um, you know, this just happened last week on The Mandalorian or what have you. And well, have yeah, on this. I'm bringing I'm bringing like a perspective that I think is unique in that it's it's my brand of overthinking at the subject. So like I come in the first miniseries, I make the analysis that whether the writers meant it or not, the character of Starscream is represents this idea that the enemy of tyranny is the individual megatron's file card his little motto is peace through tyranny he's a tyrant and all the decepticons fall in the line they all worship him they either worship him or they fear him but they ask permission to do everything and then there's this one guy in the organization who stands up to him and says like i don't think you're as great as everybody says that you are and his actions throughout the first miniseries invariably like every time he does something and he acts out of his own center he winds up making things worse for the decepticons and the autobots conversely are a bunch of ragtag guys who like optimus can't control his troops like they keep going off on their own and doing their own thing he's always 
yelling at them, come back here, don't do that. Um, yet they prevail, right? They're democracy. They're where everybody has a voice. And it's messier, and it, we bump into the walls more often, and sometimes we get hurt, but we prevail over the machine that is tyranny, uh, you know, like, and it's represented through like the Autobots being the individuals and Starscream being the indiv individual who sabotages the machine inadvertently, right? Did they mean to do this? No, but the writers were creatures of their time, and the, at the times we were living in was the United States versus Soviet Russia. We were the two superpowers in the 80s, right? Um, our president was on TV all the time talking about the evil Soviet empire. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of like hypotheses and guessing that I do allowed on the show is like, and, and I point to evidence of like, this happened, this happened, this happened. So um, that's really cool. Like in a way the um, it's a meta aspect of, of uh, the reading, watching, playing is like us being creatures of our time and just noticing the, like our creature food. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a, that's so, okay. Yep. So much for that. Um, Rob, you have a new thing that we have to, have to, have to talk about. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I, uh, in collaboration with my wife, uh, Kate Shields Stenzinger. I mean, we're also collaborative partners on a variety of things like the Art and Science Punks podcast. And we have for many years had a, um, a pretty uh, combination of, of like creative and exploratory goal planning and setting process. And we've talked about um, this in different venues and, uh, you know, Case put it into different workshops that she's, that she's taught and I've, uh, you know, brought it to different podcasts, but we've chatted about this stuff on the Lean Into Art podcast as well. But you kind of, we always knew we we're kind of building toward uh, creating some kind of thing to uh, make it uh, helpful and easy for others to participate in their own sort of fun um, goal planning and process that makes it uh, you know, like you can, you can think through different aspects of where you want to go and have like these mini facilitation creative experiences that help you capture your thoughts, but then kind of cover different needs. You don't have to sort of think of goal planning as just the whole brainstorm 50 things. No, pick the top thing that works. Right. Mm -hmm. But what if you tackle it from different angles? What if in, 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 in one situation you're imagining um, you're, you're creating a hypothetical future and then in another one, you're thinking of it as sort of a map of different potential adventures that you want to string together. And what if another one you're looking at like, well, what if I described a day without fear? And now how do these things all feed together? And we've got a few exercises. Um, by the way, there's, there's a couple of ways to get to this. Um, so we've created a journal called the Where Next Journal, and we created a workshop called Goal Setting Using Design Plus Storytelling, which uses the Where Next Journal. You can get the actual, the, the full workshop experience uh, through Gumroad or Skillshare, and just find my page on Skillshare, and you'll get this, it's like a half hour that sort of had so much context where you're not going through this journal alone. And you're getting, you're going through like this, the sort of the full version of it. There's like a 30 page journal and it's 30 pages because in a way, like every exercise has like a practice and then a dive into it section. And it's meant to sort of ramp you up and get you ready to go for it. And uh, that's why the, the big one is, is longer because it's like there's facilitation baked into the journal itself. So that actually stands alone. So if you want to just, just sort of get a copy of that, uh, that's available as well on Gumroad. There's a free version of the journal. It's only, I think it's 10 pages and that gives you a, a solid sample. You can go for that one as well. And so that one is at gum.co slash WNXTJ. That gets you the journal and if, if for the, the free 10 page. And then you could also just upgrade for five bucks and get the full 30 pages. If you want the whole experience of the, of the workshop and everything, you can go to gum.co slash GSUDS and that gets you both the journal and the videos linked in the chat and in the show notes for this episode goal setting using design and storytelling six empowering design activities it's the end of the year if you're thinking about how you're going to engage with next year's you know uh endeavors projects etc um this is worth looking into i know i'm going to use it as i begin thinking about 2020 for myself so uh Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Uh, and then finally, we got to, if you know, the other thing we want to point you at that we make is the Lean Into Art Discord, which will have an invitation link in the show notes for this episode and every episode. 
And what it is, it's, it's a chat room. It's a forum for the show. And we have different channels. There's three public channels where you can request different topics for future shows. You can comment on existing shows. And you can even, there's a challenges quest channel where you can talk about what you're working on, like what different kind of creative challenges you're, you're, you're on and share some of the work in progress. But then we've got three Patreon channels. And these ones are very specific. There's the castle level up where it's like, hey, look, I'm working on this thing. Here's like five different versions of the cover that I'm working on. I, I need to go to my brain trust. I need people whose opinions, I, I know they're going to give me thoughtful feedback to help me navigate this creative decision. That's where you can get like really honest and good feedback on works in progress. Or maybe you just want to high five. Look at this thing I made. I just want somebody to see it and tell me, good job, kid. There's nothing wrong with asking for a high five. And that's where you're post in gentle town. Uh, and finally, there's the social tab where it's just like, hey, I know happy holidays, everybody. We're on this. We're having fun times here, uh, having fun times there. This is a neat thing I saw. Um, you know, the kind of stuff that we share on social media, but this is just a place where fellow leaners can share that stuff. So once again, the Lean Into Art Discord, uh, we'll put the invitation in the show notes. Thanks to everybody who has been uh, interacting there because I'm about to read from some of that, uh, the stuff that was submitted in the Discord. So uh, there, that was the break. So are you ready to hear what some leaners are reading, watching, and playing? I think that sounds like a perfect final thought. Cool, final thought time. So um, let's see. Nate, who happens to be in the chat right now, said, uh, "Watch." You uh, we were talking about Disney Plus earlier, and if people, if we, if our ad for the Mandalorian didn't get people signed up, um, maybe these will. Uh, not that Disney Plus doesn't give us any money; they should be giving us money too. Um, mm-hmm. But Nate watched the Imagineering show on Disney Plus, and he says, "Excellent. Features the artists and makers behind the Disney theme parks. I watched it too. It's super interesting. It's really great, and it's." It also shares the journey of when Walt Disney first conceived of the, you know, the theme parks and like, you know, what his investment was in the artists and engineers who made these things possible. And then what happened after he passed and, you know, how the parks became less and less of an important thing. And all of a sudden new management came in and had a whole new vision for the thing and revitalized it. But then that hit new snags and new pitfalls, Euro Disney and so on. So uh, did you watch it, Rob? No, I have not. I forgot about Euro Disney. That was always yeah. a punchline for well, for a time, which I imagine yeah. has been resolved. But like it was, um, I mean, it's a, I, I remember at the time it was classic tone deaf America um, expanding into something, but not appreciating local cultural needs and how they could be relevant and whatnot, if I'm not mistaken. Not not to spoil anything. I don't really think if you can spoil anything about this. But yes, they talk about that. Like, for instance, you know, this thing's in France and you couldn't drink wine at the park, right? And like that's just like a cultural oversight. Like, you know, the, the French have a different relationship with alcohol than we do in the United States, right? Um, so like that that kind those little things can send profound signals to the people who are attending the thing, right? So yeah. Absolutely. It, yeah, that's a huge thing. I mean, you may if you make something that you're serving people in in other lands, um, you know, hopefully there's some forgiveness as far as a podcast. We don't exactly do translations of this and all that. Um, so I'm assuming those who are like, we, we've, we have, um, you know, English speakers who are in the, um, you know, uh, in the UK. Uh, and let's see, where else? I mean, other places in Europe that aren't in, in, uh, English as a primary uh, first language. And, mm-hmm. um, and then let's see, Australia. I haven't checked our downloads map. I've pretty sure we have some folks on there. I know we have but listeners anyway. in Jordan, you know, so. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there's there's going to be different cultural and language uh, quirks and whatnot, but we're not exactly setting up a like a, a huge product that we're dropping into um, a new context <laughs> with assumptions. And anyway, that's, I can't wait to, to check it out. Yeah, I think, I think those particular parts of the show I think you will especially enjoy as somebody who thinks a lot about like making something in the spirit of service. I mean, that's what a theme park is. You're trying to create an experience for somebody that, you know, the whole idea was, I forget the thing that's written on the front of Disneyland, but it's like something about like here, you let all of your worries of the, of the real world vanish. Cause like they don't exist here. This is a, a, a purely imaginative or imaginary place. Um, and boy, boy almighty, do they do a good job of that? Like when, have you been, I can't remember if you've been or not, Rob. You've been, right? Nope. Oh, I need to go on the Indiana Jones ride with you so bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's so bad. Um, and and like one of the I so I went on it twice because I loved it so much. And I mean, like the standing in line is almost half the fun because like you're it's walking through like an Indiana Jones temple, right? But like you get in the car and you go on this adventure with the in in Sala, you know, is narrating your trip uh, through the speaker on the car. But I didn't even know when I was on the car that the whole thing is on gimbals the, or the gimbals um, like hydraulics. So like while the wheels are always touching the ground, it's always safe. You feel like you're almost falling over the bridge all the time. And when I saw like the part, how they engineered that and what it looks like when it's in use, I was like, oh, that's why it was so immersive. I didn't even think about it at the time. All I knew was I'm trying not to die as this wall with like blow dart holes is like pumping air at my head to make me feel like darts are flying past my head, you know? <laughs> that's great. Uh, oh. Sounds fun. Oh, it's so good. All right. Um, let's see. What else we got? Um, hmm. Ashley Knapp chimed in with um, the Klaus special on Netflix. Did you watch that by any chance? I did not. I, I, I did, and I had mixed feelings about the story, but I will not uh, argue that the production values on that special are gorgeous. The colors in that show are gorgeous. Um, and the designs are just like, ugh. anybody who's a visual storyteller needs to look at that just for the designs alone. Um, I won't comment on the story itself, but... Um, but Ashley seemed to enjoy it. And I know a lot of other people have been talking about it as well. Um, and then Arthur Christmas, which is a, I want to say it's an Ardman film. I could be wrong. Um, I actually own this. Um, and it's, uh, it's, how do I describe it? Arthur Christmas. And maybe it's, maybe this is too late. To, no, I mean, if, if, if you're a person who celebrates Christmas, it goes through the 7th of January, right? Um, uh, it is the legacy of Santa Claus in that it's a family. It's a family business, and it gets passed down from Santa Claus to Santa Claus. And as, like, the younger Clauses grow up, they take the mantle. So, like, he's not immortal. It's a generational. It's a, a legacy job. And it starts the story with this: the current Santa is, like, on the verge of retirement. And he's got two sons. And one is this super high-tech, very, um, like, almost... Uh, Fortune 500 company, like CEO kind of Santa, where he's got like he's 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 modernized the operation and streamlined it to the point where it's like it's like sixty thousand elves at terminals in this giant flying ship that flies around the world, and they've they've got this down to like a precise science kind of thing. And the other son is this kind of goofball who's like he answers all the kids' letters who write to Santa, um, and he's clumsy and he's awkward, but he really really loves Christmas. And now you can see where the story's going, right? Who's mm. going to be the next Santa? Right. And the, the fulcrum point of the, the tension of the plot is a child gets missed. A child's bicycle didn't get delivered to her. And Arthur, the young clumsy kid, is like, well, this won't do. We can't have that. And the other brother, who's like very, very much into statistics and math, is like, well, that's like a billionth of a percent off. You know, we it, it's essentially 100 percent complete. So let it go. Right. <laughs> and so He's now it's becomes... like five nines of uptime for Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so the adventure turns into this this clumsy kid has to find the wherewithal to get that bike to that kid which starts a chain reaction with all the assumptions ba that all the other characters have in the story so i happen to think it's an incredibly charming story because the, the the main idea is the hero is somebody who loves children and, and wants to make children happy which you know i'm gonna i'm gonna find affinity with that kind of a story any day of the week but so mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that sounds pretty great. I have not encountered that though. Hmm, nice. I forget how I came yes. across it. But, um, one more, and then we can close this one out. And this one also comes from Nate Marcel, which is a um, "How to Stop Worrying and Start Living" by Dale Carnegie, which you can find. Um, looks like you can find it on Amazon for eight bucks. And let's see what uh, Nate had to say about it. Um, I'll go back to the, there we go. Um, oh, he just says he really liked it. <laughs> so let's see. Dale Carnegie's 6 million copy bestseller recently revised. Millions of people have been helped to overcome the worry habit. Dale Carnegie offers a set of practical formulas you can put to work today um, for, in our fast-paced world, formulas that will last a lifetime. So this is the same Dale Carnegie of, yes, it is, of how to win friends and influence people. Okay. Time-tested methods for conquering worry. Yeah, interesting. And uh, Nate comments afresh that says, yep, that's it. It's super old, but old school, but worth it. And uh, 
That's really interesting. I have recently encountered uh, or re-encountered the, the book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which early in my career was a was huge for me. And mm-hmm. because that was kind of nearish when it was published. And, um, and it was getting really popular. I think it was probably about f- five, seven years after it was initially published when I encountered it. And, uh, it, you know, it's one of those things where some some aspects may have a, a bit of a, I, I'm guessing and making comparisons that I have no idea. I've never read the book, uh, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. But if it's one of those things where uh, some things of its time, it can have some rough edges or, or, or language that's not exactly uh, out of time, but it have con- some useful concepts, right? And, you know, why not learn from any source that has a, um, you know, some kind of benefit you can, you can apply. And uh, if, if it's in an approachable enough context. I'm checking right now to see if it's on Hoopla. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. Dale Carnegie. Uh, oh, I'll be darned. So I got another auto- audiobook to add to my queue. All right. Well, Rob, did we do a podcast? I think we did. I think we did. Lots of thinking about what we're <laughs> what we're reading, watching, and playing. Okay, well, uh, and some reasons why we do it. So, um, all right, well, concluding another year of producing Lean Into Art shows. Thank you for another awesome year of doing this, Rob. Looking forward to another one. Uh, my pleasure, Jersey. It's been awesome doing this with you, and I look forward to another one as well. Hopefully some, I don't know, new experiments and stuff that uh, 2020 will bring. And that's a good, yeah. And stay tuned. In other words, we record the show every week, usually at noon on Thursdays, Eastern time. And then we stream it live on twitch.tv slash lean into art. And then we collect it as a podcast at lean into art.com and patreon.com slash lean into art video and audio your choice, how you want to consume the show. And until next time I have been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com. And I'm Rob Stenzinger, places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart. And you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.